do we have any individual that is visiting us for the first time? Any guests? I'm a guest, technically, but welcome. Happy Sabbath. We're glad you actually are here worshiping God. This is God's house, and this is the place where you need to be. Um, and I'm glad to be here because when you come to a Seventh-day Adventist church, you become part of a family, a worldwide family. Amen. And every time I get you know, the opportunity of visiting different churches in our conference, I say the same thing because I'm treated like I belong there. And I hope you are feeling the same way. And for those of you that belong to this church, I want to thank you for being here because now, today, you know, there are many of us worshiping God on His day around the world, regardless of what the world says. Those of you that actually are reading the news, you see that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is being put on the spotlight. And I was reading an article this week. One individual, I'm going to say ignorant individual, called our Seventh-day Adventist Church a sect. You know, do you know what you're talking about? We are one worldwide church with one specific purpose, which is letting people know that Jesus is coming and that he is coming soon. That's it. That's it. We are open. We're reaching out. We're not, you know, we don't have anything to hide. So if you are actually here, welcome. This is your church. And we will ask the Holy Spirit to work in your life so you can see his will in your life today. And uh, for those of you, us, you know, I'm going to be praying that God will actually show us the message that he wants to talk to us, that he wants to speak in our heart today. So when we leave, that we'll leave with something else, that we'll, we will be transformed. And that is not going to be me. That's what I'm asking. I've been asking God. So let's pray. Let's ask God to speak to us. Dear Heavenly Father, here I am again, a servant, humble servant, asking that you speak to us. There's a special message that you have for us. And let my words not be mine, but yours, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. John 17, 15, we just read it, says, My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Who is the one saying these things? Jesus. Jesus. If you have a Bible that has the red letter that points out to Jesus, you'll see that the whole section is in red. Jesus talking specifically about, you know, something that we need today. And it's powerful. So he's pointing out to a problem. And addressing at the same time, you know, what we need to do about it. From the Garden of Eden, you know, the main problem has been on the influence that it's from the outside. Which sadly corrupts the inside. Would you agree? The world actually has so much to offer that there's always a way to influence, influence God's word and God's message. Now, the world also, through research, now is saying that, yeah, it's, it's because of a cultural, you know, period in our, in, our, in our earth history that people actually allow this to happen. But now, we live in a, in a time of age where our millennials, you know who those are? The younger generation, the 20th, you know, 30-year-old that actually use technology a lot. You know, well, well, now they got it. That's what research is saying. I was reading actually the Barna, you know, study group, and Barna is, is, a, is a research, very reliable research um, organization that they say that our people now actually are going back to, you know, uh, focusing on family values and financial you know, um, well-being. You know, a lot different from those of you that were actually in the 70s and 80s. You know, I'm kind of a cut in between. Almost there? No? God, yeah, I'm young. Um, now, the sad thing that I see, even though they are consider themselves extremely spiritual, 
is that they do not consider the Bible as being the sole source of truth. Oh, careful with that. The biblical principles have been replaced with entertainment and emotions. Hmm. So if you're young, where is your source of truth? And if you're not, where is it still? So the problem we have in our current society comes from the way biblical principles are mixed with societal principles. Ultimately, separating us from our source of life, from our creator. So once again, following moral values that contradict God's purpose in our life will ultimately again separate us from him. Are you with me? So on the other hand, God, God's ultimate goal is to restore from the beginning. He has reached out to us, to each one of you, to me on a daily basis, trying to restore that broken relationship brought to us, to ourselves by sin by going against God's purpose in our life. And people come and the society says, oh, please, don't, don't give us that. That is not right. We want to please ourselves and we want to do our own things. God, we got it, but this is what we want to do. We are destroying ourselves. God, on the other hand, has given everything for us to restore that. And we find that in, the, in, a, in our best known Bible verse, John 3, 16. And you can repeat it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have amen for that. Amen. So there's hope, regardless of what this society tells us. I, John, thank you so much for leading the, the Sabbath school, you know, the study of the lesson, which I felt like um, I don't need to preach. Jeremiah went through, you know, the same issues. You know, the, the Israelites were not, Judah was, was, you know, I'm sorry to say this, was messed up. That society was messed up. And Jeremiah was confronted with the same challenges that we have today. We're given a message. You know, this society is rejecting God openly. But not only that, they're making things look like they're the real thing. It's like, you know, um, the story that, that I, I thought of is of, of this, you know, God's, God's purpose in our life is like this ship that was going through the ocean. And suddenly, you know, carrying marines, and suddenly it hit a piece of ice. And, and, and the, the ship was damaged, badly damaged, and water, water was actually coming in. So the captain quickly analyzed the situation and determined that in order for everyone to be saved, the door right, you know, on the bottom of the ship needed to be closed. You know, they have different compartments. And this actually is something similar to what happened to the Titanic. That door that divided some of the sections that was damaged needed to be closed because the water was filling up fast. So the captain actually gathered quickly his marines and they and he said well this is what the problem is this is what needs to be done and suddenly kind of immediately one of the marines stood up and said captain I'm willing to go down and take care of this and accomplish you know this mission now the captain's eyes suddenly you know turned in, 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 in amazed because there was something special about this marine and this situation. But he knew what the outcome was going to be if someone didn't step up. So he nodded and agreed to this marine's request. So this marine quickly jumped into the water, 
swam through the cold, freezing waters, got under the ship, got through the hole, went, and, and everyone was expecting until they heard that noise of metal and kind of a wheel, screechy sound of, a, a, you know, a shutting door. And then there was silence. No one said a word. The captain kept, kept listening, and nothing happened. Their fate was in this one individual. This is when the captain did not contain himself. The marine that had saved the whole ship was no other than his own son, whom he had given his life for everyone else. This was an actual story. Compare that to God. He gave his only begotten son so we could be saved from a polluted world. The reality, you know, of this polluted society in us is that it has great effects, and not only on us, but especially on our young ones, our youth. Why? Because they're not ready for it. They're still developing their values. They're still trying to figure out who they are. So the devil knows exactly how to do that, how to use those things. Now, for such one, we must guard well the avenues of the soul to keep out those things that corrupt the soul. Parents, you need to guard the souls of the hearts of your kids. Now, in 1 John 2, 15 through 17, if you have your Bibles, let's, let's read through that. 1 John, New Testament, chapter 2, verse 15 through 17 says... Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, it's not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away, and also its lust. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. Are you there? You got it? There's hope. This is not the end. We live in a polluted world. We live in a, in a society that tells us that what God says is wrong, but that's not it. We have hope only if we know what God, God's plan is. So truly, great care must be exercised in the choice of entertainment, reading materials, video choices, and how we use the internet. It really concerns me when I see my own children surfing the web. When I see people going online and just doing stuff. We must not allow the standards of society to become acceptable when God has clearly spoken about those issues. For that reason, here we go. There's, there's a plan, okay? For that reason, the home, the church, and the school must join forces to protect, especially the young. Satan specifically has a plan for the young people, our children. But the blessing is that God has a plan as well. So how thankful I am for his special instruction, aligning the work of education of our young children. And this can be found on, on a book called Education, if you don't know, it, written by Ellen G. White, which she says, in this time of special danger for the young, Temptation surrounds them on every hand. And while it is easy to drift, the strongest effort is required in order to press against the current. Every school should be a city of refuge for the tempted youth. A place where their fathers should be dealt with patiently and wisely. So as, as a servant of God, at the Arizona conference, I can tell you that I'm so happy 
to see that this community, the Bisbee community, has understood the need of establishing a school next door. I was so excited today driving by, seeing that building, you know, wow. You know, that building in this community is a city of refuge to protect our young lambs, our children. Protect our kids from the roaring lion as we find in 1 Peter 5.8. You know this verse, right? You know, be sober, be sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Now, at the same time, this does, does not mean that the devil stays out of our churches and our schools. Be aware of that. Being here doesn't mean that everything is nice and handy. Everything's the same. He never gives up. And it's everyone seeking to destroy. Our students are never exempt from the need to make wise choices. Hmm. On the other hand, I know that our school provides many opportunities to help its students develop what they need spiritually. Classes integrate biblical spiritual values across the curriculum. Social activities are provided that elevate rather than bring down. Physical activities are designed to recreate. And the mental development focuses on the true source of knowledge, which is God, our creator. You have an opportunity. And you have a responsibility. If you're here, God call you not to sit down to warm this, you know, the seed, the abuse. You are called to serve him, especially protecting the young ones. Not only here, but in the whole community. Now, on a personal, personal note, I have to say, I have to admit, that Adventist education actually allow me the opportunity to be here today. Because if it wasn't for Adventist education, I would not be here talking to you. The world, a couple of years ago, had the same influence on me. Um, and I can say that now it has more. Back in the day, those of you that are really young, you know, we didn't have any internet, right? Of course not. So we had to find different ways of entertaining ourselves. And I remember one year, I actually had, had the blessing of receiving Adventist education all of my elementary school years. But when I reached middle school, we moved here to the United States. And, you know, we had to face different financial challenges with my family. So my parents could not afford sending me to an Adventist school. So I had the privilege, and I'm going to say this, a privilege of attending a very well-known in the community, in the Texas community, uh, middle school. Had a great building, great teachers, great resources. And I was able to learn a lot. Academically, I, I did well. But the problem came when the group of kids that I got to know started influencing my decisions. And suddenly I started becoming more like them, rather than them becoming more like me. I was not becoming this beacon of light in that school setting. My, my light started to fade away. Now, I'm not speaking against our you know, public school system because I worked in them later on in life, but there's some things that we cannot control. And you know what? My lights changed completely. And what I was thinking about was about the money. I was I started thinking about a teenager, hello, thinking about sex, thinking about, well, not thinking, but I was exposed to sex and drugs, alcohol. And I'll tell you, this actually was challenging because my parents worked so, so much to keep up you know, with the financial responsibilities, that they actually were, you know, working two jobs, and I was home alone when I came back from school for about an hour and a half, two hours. Um, and I had one friend, George, and Victor, 
and I forgot everybody else's name, but those were the two ones that I can remember. Especially George, because he was kind of the leader of the pack. And, and I, I, I related to them because I could communicate with them. I shared some you know, similarities in our culture. And, and George was such a nice guy that he always looked out for the well-being of everybody else. So one day, George, being that nice guy, came to me and said at school, by the way, it was at school. It was on a recess. Hey, Gus, I have something for you. And he pulled something out of his sleeve. Try it. It's on me. It was a tiny little white powder. Why not? No one will notice. Hey, why not? Go ahead. Well, thank you, but no thank you. Okay, no problem. We're still cool, right? Yeah, 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 it's okay. Well, uh, a few days later, I was, you know, he knew that I was home alone. So he came and knocking on, on our apartment door and, hey, Gus, my parents are not home. I have a couple of girls. We have beer. We have stuff for you. Let's go and try it. Uh, I'm busy. I'm busy. And my parents actually have, they want me to do something else. Thank you, but no thank you. How did I come to that? Being a teenager, being influenced by all this group of kids. How? Because I was given the opportunity of having a solid foundation. Being able to distinguish what was wrong and what was not. So, Bisbee community, your job is extremely important. Not because you are, you know, experienced in life, but because you have a lot of kids in this community that need to know those biblical principles. They need to know that the, the devil is like a roaring lion polluting this society, this community. That what they see on television, what they read online, it's not really what God's plan is for them. People need you. And you are blessed to have a school that can serve the purpose that this community needs. It's not easy because I know that the devil is not happy. He will do everything possible to deter you from, you know, from, from the mission that you have. But God has a plan. And you know what? This plan has a purpose. And this purpose will be, will be able to see the fruit very soon. Because the more I read on the news, the more excited I become. You know, people are panicking. Some people are actually posting stuff you know, online saying, the world is near. Oh, what's going to happen? No. Relax. Jesus is coming. And everything points out that it will happen soon. And I, I, I can tell you that I believe that I'm going to be alive. And I'm going to see, as, as, as our, the prophecies say, that I'm going to see my dad who passed away a couple of years ago. I'm going to see him rise up to meet God. And I'm still going to be waiting until my time is up. And I'm going to join. And I'm going to walk to heaven with all of my students. Oh. How exciting is that? Being a teacher, being able to see my own students go to heaven with me and celebrate God's mercy and love and be restored. Be restored physically. I'm short. I'm going to be tall. I'm going to be you. But I'm going to know who you are because God will keep me who I am. And I'll be able to celebrate his love and mercy forever. All because of the opportunity I had of at home, at church, and at school. I'm here to invite you to recommit your life to, to God. This is a personal matter. And, and support this mission that we have here in the Bisbee community. Yes, I am the superintendent of education. 
Yes, I'm talking to you about the importance of Adventist education, but it's more than that. It's reaching this community. This is an excuse, but it's preparing and it's providing a solid foundation to our young kids because they will take over. I will not be here. They will. And I want them to be here when Jesus comes. Amen. Let me pray with you one more time. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the commission. Thank you for the invitation you are giving us this morning to put our eyes in you and be able to focus on you as this world is so polluted. Lord, we know that you're coming soon. And we want to see our young children. And thank you, Lord, for opening the doors to, for the Bisbee community to have a Seventh-day Adventist church that believes in your word. Allow us to support, to be able to reach this community in many, many creative ways so they can know who you are. And Lord, this morning we also place ourselves in your hand. We know that you will do miracles and that we will be transformed. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for loving us. In the precious name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Stand with me if you would we'll, for our closing hymn, hymn number 653, Lead Them, My God, to Thee. We'll sing all four verses.
bow our heads. Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the blessings that we have received being here together in your home today. Help us to take these blessings with us, that our hearts and our dedication to you will be renewed, and that we will live for you with all of our hearts. Thank you for the strength that you have promised to give us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.